Hello and welcome. I am so excited to welcome you all here to Alta Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we are going to have a discussion on the James Webb Space Telescope with astrophysicist Professor Garth Illingworth. My name is Beth Spotswood and I am Alta's digital editor. So today, we're going to discuss the incredible images that have come back from the James Webb Space Telescope called Webb, for those of you in the know. Um, um, with Professor Illingworth. He goes by Garth. He is a very casual professor, but he happens to be a distinguished professor emeritus at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He was a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley, the Deputy Director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, and in 2010 was awarded an Honorary Doctorate of Science degree at the University of Western Australia. He is the recipient of the 2016 American Astronomical Society Lancelot M. Berkeley New York Community Community Trust Prize for his work on the most distant galaxies viewed with the Hubble Space Telescope. He is an extraordinary guest. We are overwhelmed and delighted to have him here today. Today's interview was inspired by a special, a special section in the current issue of Alta, the new space age. We didn't cover the James Webb Space Telescope um, in this issue for a number of reasons, including the first images arrived after this Im issue went to print. Um, the images that we're gonna look at today, and I'm sure that you've seen in the news, are incredibly new, brand 30 years in the making, but brand new to us Earthlings. So it is very exciting um, to welcome Garth here today. He worked on the first iteration. He was one of three people kind of tasked with um, starting this project, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, and um, only this summer have we received the first results back from it. So it's really exciting. Brief housekeeping before we begin. Alta Live is the digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. If you are unfamiliar with Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. You can join us as a member for as little as $3 a month and support the work we do, including our monthly California book club, which is free and very fun to join. We have weekly events like this, newsletters. I hope you will check us out. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of this screen to ask questions for Professor Illingworth. We'll chat for about 30 minutes and then get to as many questions as we can. This interview will be recorded and posted to ultaonline.com later today. Um, we're also going to send you an email with a link to this interview, a link to Professor Illingworth's website, how to view the web images on NASA's website, their own website. You can follow them on Twitter, Instagram. Um, it's it's a really exciting topic that's going on, and I'm psyched to get to talk about it today. Please, I see Lynn from Novato zooming in. I myself am in Novato. Garth, where are you today? Hi, Beth. Hi. Well, I'm in Santa Cruz. <laughs> earth. Here on Earth. Sorry? Here, here on Earth. We're all... Oh, yes, definitely on open. Earth. A very hot Earth in California at the moment. <laughs> that's true. Um, first of all, Congratulations. I, you know, I was admitting to you before we began that the, the last time I had really studied space, but before preparing for our conversation today was around 1987 when I was in fourth grade and, you know, made my little solar system diorama. But learning about the achievement um, of the decades long, $10 billion, thousands of, of brilliant minds working together. Um, and actually really making something work is extraordinary. So congratulations to you and all of your colleagues. Um, what was the, what were the kind of first iterations of this space telescope? What was the original plan? So it really does go back over 30 years now when we were working to prepare Hubble for launch. We hadn't even launched Hubble. And so my director, Nobel Prize, ultimately a Nobel Prize winner, Riccardo Giacconi, came in one day and said to me, you need to start working on what comes after Hubble. And I said, oh, no, we're working really hard on Hubble. And so, but he said, trust me, it takes a long time. And, you know, being director and, of course, having been uh, incredibly experienced already in space, we said, okay, so yes, sir, <laughs> we're off to do it. And so we started thinking about it and we spent a couple of years doing that and then organized the first ever conference with engineers and scientists in 1989 in the big auditorium of Space Telescope 
about doing a major new telescope that would go and do things that would Hubble would be unable to do. So we were conceptualizing what would come beyond Hubble before Hubble. Extraordinary. And then when Hubble launched, it at first didn't work. It was it was mm. out of focus. And astronauts then had to go and add an additional camera. In fact, you did a TED talk on this, which again, we're going to send you the link to. <laughs> um, but, but you know, I read somewhere that for the James Webb Space Telescope to work, which was launched in December of 2021 and started to return images this summer, 295 things had steps had to go right um, from launch to the images to come back. And every single one went right. How it, does that it. feel? Lo, these years <laughs> later, you get to watch as a now a distinguished professor. You can kind of feel this work that started in 1987 um, worked. How does it feel? Well, it feels great, but it was really scary after the launch because we had, you know, like the Mars missions, people talk about seven minutes of terror as the lander is coming down when you can't see what's going on. We had 29 days of terror where we had these hundreds of 50 major items that uh, had to actually work and move into place and hundreds of what are called single point failures. So if any one of these motions had been interrupted because some part did not work, that would have essentially led to a web not working at all or working very poorly. So that 29 days was incredibly uh, stressful, but everything worked amazingly well, absolutely amazingly. And we see here one of the results. Yes. This is, is, this exactly. is a very kind of kaboom. The universe has paid you back here with what <laughs> looks to me to be a painting. Um, clearly the mind of, you know, a creative, has has made this, but that's not the case. This is legitimately outer space. Exactly. What are we looking at? So we're looking at the Carina Nebula here. So let me just back up a little and say, yeah. so launched on Christmas morning, an absolutely flawless launch on a European rocket out of South America, out of French Guiana. And then Webb went through its essentially remarkable deployment activities. And then it got into another five months of commissioning where we set up everything to work to make the optics absolutely pristine and the instruments to work. And the end result of that is that NASA loves to do these, uh, what they call early release observations where you pick a number of images that you know are gonna be dramatic. And I should say, of course, this is NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. This is an international joint project. And those space agencies supplied a lot of crucial parts, instruments and so on. So it's together a really cooperative activity. So what then, once the instruments were actually working in June, NASA and the Space Telescope Science Institute and the other agencies had coordinated making some great images. And they chose this one as one of those images. And this is a nebula in our galaxy. It's the Carina Nebula. Um, I was just checking my notes here to see. So it's about 7,600 light years away from us. It's a region where stars and planets are forming. And it's absolutely amazing to look at this. In the upper part, there are really bright stars there. They are so hot and emitting so much light that the gas and dust that's below the brown areas is actually being abraded away by their strong radiation, strong light. And you can see blue streamers rising up. That's hot gas and dust that is driven out of the nebula by those stars. But deep within that nebula, there are just dozens, hundreds, thousands of amazing little regions where stars are forming out of the gas and dust and planets will be forming as well. So this is a nursery for bearing stars being born. Stars like our sun must have gone through this four or five billion years ago when it was born. But we're seeing this process here now in this absolutely amazing three-dimensional image. Every time I look at this, I can't, I'm just staggered by what we're seeing here. 
did you have any idea you know even when hubble was sending images back that one day we would see anything that looked like this well not really it's hard to imagine because web works in a region that our hubble doesn't work it works much further to the infrared and so it can reveal information it can look through dusty regions and see stars forming in ways that Hubble never could and so one can sort of imagine maybe what it would look like and you can imagine artist impressions being done but the reality just was amazing and the beauty of this image when you look at the three-dimensionality the structure there is uh out of this world literally <laughs> Um, so this is this is actually an artist rendering of the Webb um, Space Telescope, but I just wanted to kind of give our audience an idea of what we were dealing with here, which is an incredibly complex. I heard I read somewhere that it is the most complex project ever sent into space. Um, the the kind of solar panels, I guess, that we're looking at, that's the size of a tennis court. Um, the mirrors, the mirror images there had to be folded up and then released and aligned in outer space. It took about six months, I understand, to do all of this. When you began designing this, like, as it were, um, did it look anything like this? How, you know, was it, <laughs> this is uh, why. So, you know, when we were thinking about this 33 years ago and we heard our, held our first workshop, we had a very sort of almost pencil drawn sketches very simple compared to this we had the basic concept we wanted an infrared telescope we wanted it to be really big we needed knew that it needed to be a long way from earth so it could get extremely cold but it didn't look like this at all this really came as um, the technology improved over the 10 years or so after our first meeting and also a realization just exactly what was needed I mean, we're looking at a, a gossamer, five layers of gossamer thin plastic there in that huge sun, sun shield, which is a tennis court size sun shield. This was all, fold, as Beth said, all folded up to fit on the rocket. And to give a sense of scale, if you put two Chevy Suburbans end to end, stood them up, that's about the size of web when it's all folded up and about the weight too, actually. So that's what we launched in space with two giant Chevy Suburbans though a little more expensive than two Chevy Suburbans. <laughs> um, and this is, I mean, unlike the Hubble, which was relatively close and that astronauts were able to go and do some repair work on it, this is over a million miles away. Is If something goes wrong now, it's working great. If something goes wrong now, there's is there any way to fix it, to get it back? It's in, it's in a, it's kind of in a fixed position, if I understand correctly. Yes, yeah, so it, you're right. It's a million miles away. It's be, way beyond the moon, and it's lined up with the Earth and Moon. So Webb sits a million miles from us, further away from the sun. It's, and the back of it, the sun shield, is uh, facing the Earth and Moon and the sun. And that's the, because we have to keep the mirror and the telescope incredibly cold. It's cooled down 400 degrees below zero, 400 degrees Fahrenheit almost to absolute zero and the universe is acting as a giant refrigerator but if the sun was on that mirror or any part of it it would heat it up greatly and so we had to put in this five layer plastic sun shield which has an spf of about a million so it's a pretty good <laughs> uh sun shield uh you know pretty good sunscreen <laughs> um i just i wanted to kind of there first of all so much um, so many resources and information is available um, and provided by NASA and presumably by the European and Canadian agencies as well. Um, but it's extraordinary that, that, I mean, of course, our tax dollars have funded this, but that all of this information is available to everyone. And we will send you links to it, but I really encourage our audience to go check this out because I've had so much fun learning about this. But can you give us a, I have I have very specific questions. We're going to look at some more pretty pictures, but can you give us kind of the gist of how this works? Do you aim it in a, the, the universe is vast? Do the group of geniuses back home say, all right, we're going to point this way, folks, and 
and aim on this for a while, get some images back, and then we're going to move over here and point this way. How does this all work? What's the plan? Yeah, so scientists, every year we get an opportunity to ask to do the various science programs. And then to do that, one those that are selected to do it, very competitive process, give a target. We want to go look at this distant galaxy. We want to go look at this star to see if we can see some information about a possible planet. And so that's all uploaded with software that moves the whole telescope. But of course, the telescope has to always face away from the sun. We cannot afford to let the, any sunlight touch on the telescope itself. So it's a very complex process of identifying which target and when in the year that can be done and moving the telescope or the whole telescope, the mirror and the sun shield around on the sky to point at the object that one wants to take an image of or a spectrum where you spread the light out. And then the telescope will sit there for hours, minutes, generally hours is sort of a typical time to take some information and then move on to the next one. And it's mostly autonomous that the uploads are done. There's a lot of planning. It's sort of daily, weekly, monthly. But the actual uh, pointing of the telescope is not controlled by anybody on the ground. We tell it where to go, and it goes and does it and collects the information and sends it back to us. It's one of the 295 things that are working. <laughs> yeah, well, a whole lot more than that even. <laughs> um, so, so this is that they're kind of, I had read, and I'm hoping that you can kind of briefly, you know, give us a, a high school AP version of this, but there are four components to the telescope, if I understand correctly, that bring us back in data. Yes, so exactly. So a telescope is basically just a big mirror for collecting light. But what we really need to do is to turn that light into an image or something that we can use to do the science on or that we can display, like you've seen as these wonderful images have come back. And so the Europeans built an, an instrument or an instrument and a half, actually. The Canadians built one. And we here build another sort of one and a half instrument. So there's four different ways of collecting the information and looking at it. These, in many ways, they're very simply, they're just like the camera in, an, in a regular iPhone or whatever. They're a little bit bigger and a, a lot more expensive, but you collect the light in the same way and you can turn it into an image and that's transmitted back to Earth. And then we can process it to see the amazing information that we glean about the universe. And those instruments all sit behind the mirror there and collect that information. And then it's shipped down and sent back through antennas, actually into a space system and then down to the ground. Is there a team down on the ground who's just there basically getting mail from space, like of images <laughs> jumping well, up and down? <laughs> exactly. So the data, there's an awful lot of data, gigabytes of data that come out of this every day. And that goes down through um, the uh, deep space network that's you know, at um, JPL and then back to Baltimore to the Space Telescope Science Institute into a big archive. And it's done some processing there. And then it's distributed to the community. And folks can go into that also and get that information as well. Not all of it is public at any one point. Some of it is kept private for a year to particular people. But uh, there's a huge amount of information that is public. And so folks can go in there and get some of that, yeah, yeah, those images or the spectra where the light is spread out and, and look at them and see if they can learn from it or try and do some science on it. Anybody can do that. Why is it kept secret for a year? This is a curious <laughs> fact of history. I think uh, in, in the past, it was very common for astronomers to, when they asked for, to do a certain project, they would get the data and they were allowed to keep it to themselves. This is sort of continuing with this mission. I think it's the last mission that will ever be done for it. I think it's it quite um, not inappropriate is maybe a little too strong a word, but I think in the present day and age where we're so used to public information, I think all the data that comes back from the telescope should be available immediately to everybody for people to look at and do the best science with. But so it's a somewhat historical 
and anachronistic in my view approach to doing science that some of the data is in a sense hidden for a year is it hidden so that people can analyze it and make sure there's nothing that's going to freak us out no it's not that it's really that to give opportunity and to the folks who came up with the idea and to give them an advantage as it were and um as i said it's sort of a historical precedent and tradition that I think is quite irrelevant in the modern age where we're really open. We want to have open data sets. We want to be able to access the data. And so I would really like to see this change. Hubble has had this for much of its life too, but it's changing. The period is now six months. And I think we're looking to the point where all the data is available immediately that is taken and put into the archive. So that's my goal is to help us all get to that point. All right, this was at least one of the first pictures that was released to the public from Webb. Um, what are we looking at? So we're looking at a picture of the sky. Uh, <laughs> Webb, uh, Hubble did this back in 1995 when it took the Hubble deep field, the first image of a blank piece of sky. There was nothing there that we could see on our ground telescopes, maybe a few brighter objects. And so what was decided was, let's see what happens if we take a deep picture of the sky. A lot of astronomers thought, ah, oh, you're never going to see anything much. But there were many of us who thought, well, let's try it anyway. And the director at that time at Space Telescope Institute really wanted to do this. And when they did it, it was just, it totally blew us all away that there's a universe just full, filled with these faint, distant galaxies. And that has set the stage for two decades of work now on trying to understand the buildup of galaxies from the very earliest times in the universe to what our Milky Way is now. And these images play an amazing role in doing that. So that... Sorry, I should say, I mean, every one of those objects in there is actually a little galaxy, much smaller than our Milky Way, but it's a galaxy. There are essentially no stars here. So each one of these things has millions to billions of stars in them. They're just so far away, they just look like faint little blobs. There's just one star in the middle of that one I can see in this particular image. Is the star the, the kind of the plus sign? Yep, exactly. Right yep. Interesting. All right. Okay, so this is, is an oft-analyzed image um that has come back from Webb. what is this the tarantula so this is another one of these uh remarkable star forming regions this is actually not in our galaxy but it's in the large Magellanic cloud which is a nearby small galaxy a sort of satellite to our giant and beautiful Milky Way and of course it's just visually dramatic image again but it also is really interesting because it's uh this little uh, smaller galaxy actually is is probably more representative of what galaxies were like early in the universe so we can study the formation of stars and the growth of stars which have somewhat different characteristics to what is in our galaxy and it's just you know looking at this again it's it's like the Carina nebula you can sit here and look at this and just be entranced by what you see in an image like this um, when when these images are returned, is there, I mean, I know that thousands of people have worked on this, are currently working on this. Is there a group that says, okay, we're going to take this section of the results and go and analyze it and spend ye months, years, whatever it takes, trying to figure out what we're looking at, while another group takes another image? There, it's so big. I just don't understand how you're going to get all this information and start to understand it just because it's an exhaustive amount of opportunity. Yeah, you, this is really interesting. So of course, an image like this is public and so it's available for anybody to analyze. And so I think what we saw with the early releases on web was that folks got in there and all different teams started got the data and started trying to understand what it was showing and they were basically competing with each other to produce results and so there's very little in the way of a sort of coordination between the groups and that works fine 
know, folks have different ideas, they have different approaches. And so they will get in there and try to understand one aspect of the data and write a paper about it. And another group might be doing the same thing. So they're directly competing or working on it and very often on a different aspect. And so we learn a lot of things from different groups working through these data sets, which is another reason why I like to have these made publicly available. I think it's just wonderful for the science to have lots of different folks working with the data, trying to understand different aspects. And, and then you put it all together in a very public way. The papers are published. People un can understand and take steps on then and move on from that as well with new information. Is the competition friendly? <laughs> it can get pretty fierce, but largely really? friendly. <laughs> Is there anything in these images? What kind of? I, I think I agree with your philosophy of making everything available to the public. Is there any danger in doing that? Is there any kind of component that would that make this information that use of this information could be? utilized for bad instead of good? No, I don't think so. You know, I think that there, I've been working now for over 20 years myself on the very earliest galaxy. So that image you showed before, that's the sort of image I've worked on now for decades. That's always been public, those data sets. And I think, you know, we've just learned so much from having different approaches. So one group has an idea and goes in and works through the data to collect some results. And so that very dynamic approach, I think, is how science progresses best. So I really like doing things in a very sort of open and mostly friendly, competitive way. Wow, this, this is wonderful. I love this image. <laughs> this is Jupiter. Yep. All right. So here's my question about Jupiter, my favorite planet. I am. Um, if the previous images we were looking at are looking at we're, we're, the distant, distant past. We're, we're talking about things that are formed right after the Big Bang. Did someone kind of tilt the Webb telescope a little to the left and say, let's just give them Jupiter right now as a, as a I don't know, fun picture? I mean, it seems like Jupiter <laughs> is pretty close comparatively. Um, yeah, so how are we doing both Jupiter and galaxies from millions and millions of years ago. Yes, exactly. So, you know, we do different things like the tarantula nebula that um, you showed. You know, that's the light took 160,000 years to reach us from that galaxy. That's pretty small. I work on things where the light takes 13 billion years to reach us. So, you know, the range of things that we do with this telescope are amazing. And so every now and again, you know, there are a whole slew of folks who work on the planets and are trying to understand what's going on. So information like this on Jupiter, not only is it just a spectacular image, it provides unique insights because we now have a telescope that can show infrared characteristics of Jupiter. So they can put it together with Hubble, they can put it together with the information from the flybys that we do directly in the solar system. And so, you know, you can look at this and think, oh, this is just incredible. Look at the spot. Look at the detail here. What's it telling us what about the, spot? the atmosphere? Yep. I don't work on this, so I don't know a great deal about this as a scientist. I'm guessing I'm just... you know more about this than everyone else watching this. <laughs> what's, the, what's this like white dot? You know, it's really a, in a sense, a giant storm in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Awesome. And it's been going for a long, long time. And so, you know, ever since we've been looking at Jupiter and had telescopes to do it, this spot has been there. And so that is humongous. <laughs> Jupiter it's is a big planet. The Earth is pretty tiny by comparison. I've got more Jupiter for you. So what are <laughs> we, what are, you know, I mean, obviously this is like, this looks fake. Um, I know it's real, but this is an extraordinary. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot more going on than I guess I previously knew. There's rings. There's is this another? Is this a moon that's kind of to the left? Yeah, there's it? a moon. There's a you know really faint ring that was you know only discovered. I think I don't. I can't quite remember now, but you know, decades ago, um, there's an amazing auroras at the at the poles of Jupiter there. So there is an immense amount of information here. And this is actually a good 
place to say too. So I sat through in Baltimore in the Space Telescope Science Institute in the same auditorium where we held the first workshop 33 years earlier, when these images, the first early release images were shown to everybody on July the 12th. And for an hour, we had image after image, so six images. And the amount of information there, I realized that I was looking at an unbelievable amount of scientific information there that would take years to analyze, even just from that first sort of hours of observations. So this is another one that will add to our knowledge of Jupiter and our solar system immensely. But it will take a long time to put all this together with everything else that we have to really understand what's going on. Wow. When you were in that auditorium and they're releasing these pictures, and I imagine it's all people who have kind of, like you, earned their seat in the auditorium, have worked on this, have, have had the passion for it. What was the energy like when those first pictures came back? I imagine it was, you know, like a One Direction concert for teenagers. I mean, I <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> exactly. So nobody who was sitting in that audience had really seen the images. You know, they were kept back from everybody, all the public and everybody in that auditorium and shown for the first time. And so people would cheer, they would be clapping <laughs> because it was just, you know, as, as you've all seen with those images, they're just truly spectacular. And not only, I mean, they were chosen to be spectacular, but as I said, I think any of the scientists in the audience were thinking that is amazing that we are seeing things here for the very first time. And it's going to take us a lot of work to actually understand what's going on. The images that come back from Webb are not only images, but they are, it's data that's interpreted by scientists and computers, and then kind of the data is added to the images. So, so I take it that, you know, what we're seeing in terms of when, when we're looking at like a, a super gorgeous Jupiter, this is not just a picture from a telescope. This is a lot of work went into this is data was added to the snapshot that was sent back from Webb. Yeah, so it is interesting. So Webb takes images in a way just like our phones, but it takes sort of a black and white image. Our cameras and our phones and so on are set up to take actually blue, green, red images and combine them right then and there to make what we actually see. But what happens with Webb is we take, you know, like a blue image, a green image and a red image. It comes back sort of, as you might think of a black and white with a different color information. And so the computer processing puts that together, but it doesn't add anything. All that information is really there in these images as you're seeing it. It's just that what has happened here is the generation, the combination of these separate black and white images to make the color information. Uh, so, you know, what you see is what, what is being delivered down from web pretty much, removing all the artifacts. You know, there are artifacts in these things, and just as the cameras do as well, if there are any artifacts that they are taken out also. But this is what web was sending down, basically. This image shows the difference between a Hubble image and a web image. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, my layman's kind of interpretation is the point is detail. Yes. So Webb is a bigger telescope. Um, it's working redder in the infrared, redder than our eyes can see. And Hubble is really looking pretty much as our eyes can see. So the clarity on Webb is a little better. Um, but also we can see through things better. And it's far more sensitive because it's a three times bigger mirror as well. And so Hubble, as we've all seen over the years, has returned some absolutely amazing images. But as you show here, when the contrast, when you take the same images, Webb is just better. And it should be. You know, it's now 30 years of, a, of technology development, a huge amount of resources. So we're with, you know, the next generation is what we called Webb when we were first talking about it. And it is the next generation. It's a step beyond Hubble. Um, I notice here, and again, all of these are are grabbed from NASA's site and available to right. anyone. It's so fantastic. But you is is much of the project 
um, the idea of kind of combining information, information that was received from Hubble as seen on the left um, and Webb on the right and kind of putting it together, getting, I mean, combining all of this information to get a, a more accurate picture of what's going on. Exactly. So, you know, Webb can do things alone that will reveal a lot about galaxies, about stars, about how they form and will do so. But where we have the opportunity to combine it with the Hubble data, you gain a whole new dimension. Hubble works much bluer and actually can go down even below where our eyes can see into the ultraviolet. And so when you can combine images with a huge color range, as it were, Webb and Hubble together, that really returns a, a lot more information. And particularly, Webb is really good at seeing through dusty regions. And so Webb will enable us to peer into objects much more than Hubble has been able to do. But it's also good to be able to just see where all that dust and so on is. And so this combination is incredibly powerful and will be used a lot. As these images are analyzed and are used, um, what does it mean for the rest of it? What does it mean for humanity? What does it mean for me or my child or my grandkids one day? How is this going to be used? If this is billions of years ago, what's it got to yeah. do with so, my problems? You know, what we're looking at here is actually a galaxy like our own Milky Way. Of course, we can't see our Milky Way. It's not as though we can take a drone and go around the Milky Way. Even at the speed of light, it would be 100,000 years or more to do that. So we go to look at other galaxies. And so we're trying to understand, you know, what our Milky Way is like. But if I step back and say, you know, why do we do this? Why is everybody interested in what a telescope like Hubble or Webb tells us? And I think this is really about our origins. We're trying to understand our origins, not only as people, but in terms of our planet, and how the universe built up, how galaxies grew from the very first stars right through now to the magnificent objects like this one here. And so I think we're, you know, there's a universal interest in trying to understand sort of how our place in the universe and how it all grew over time and then how, you know, the life on Earth formed and whether we're alone. There are just questions after questions that come up. And I always sort of succinctly summarize it as, you know, it's a search for origins in so many different ways. Since you brought it up, and I think that I would guess much of our audience is curious, um, do you believe we will find intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, other galaxies with Yeah, so it's so a fascinating question. You know, I think 30 years ago, we didn't even know that other planets existed. And so outside our solar system, I think we suspected it. Then the very first exoplanets were found. And since that time, our various telescopes, Hubble and other telescopes, Kepler and so on, have found immense numbers of planets. And now we think sort of most stars are likely to have planets. Most of those planets are not gonna be habitable in the way that we think is needed for life, the right temperatures, the right elements, the right conditions. So we're now searching for planets that have the characteristic sort of of Earth where complex molecules could build up and form life. So I suspect that their, their life, I think, is pretty ubiquitous. Intelligent life, I think, is a challenge. When you think about it, I mean, we've been here now for hundreds of years, thousands of years on a planet that is billions of years old. And so that's a really tiny fraction. And so we can always step back and say, and how long, much longer are we likely to last if we don't be careful about how we treat ourselves and the planet? So it's a very complex question. I think there's really likely to be intelligent life out there, but the sort of number of civilizations at any point, I think is a very, it's a good philosophical question for discussion, but not something that we as scientists can answer at this point or provide. I think we can provide some insights, but we can't really answer it. Sure. Well, I appreciate you taking it seriously, though, because it's something that kind of, you know, has has garnered that our human 
um, imagination since, you know, as long as yep. it's been alive. Yes, definitely. No, I think it's a question that so many folks have. And it into plays into a lot of what we and again my origin square sort of comment not only about the planets and how they formed and the stars and all the way back through galaxies but you know life plays a big part of that question i want to show this i believe this is a death of a star and then we're going to try and get to some audience questions um yeah. uh a lot of and and there hasn't been a ton necessarily that's been released i imagine that there is a ton of information that nasa has not all of it has been released to the public but there is origin we we see the kind of origin of galaxies after the big bang this is the death i think of a star so we're seeing the beginnings and endings are we are we looking to study how we might end Yes, exactly. So, you know, there are stars end their lives in pretty dramatic ways. Some of them blow up with incredible ferocity and incredible amounts of energy. This actually is sort of a more gentle death. And what is the bright star you see there is actually not the one that's old and dying. Just to the left of that bright white star, there's a little red dot, which is barely visible here but is visible in some of the other images. And that's the one that's ejecting all this gas and dust and it's sort of death throes as it is ejecting material from its shell. So there's actually two stars in the middle of this and there is this bright younger star, which is illuminating it. And together this makes this just truly amazing image. Was this one of the images that got the applause from the auditorium? Oh, hall? very much so. All of them <laughs> did. I mean, everybody was, ah. Oh. Every one of those was amazing. <laughs> so there you can see it on the there right I, is the, yeah. are the two stars. And it's the little red one that is in its death throes and throwing off its uh, envelope of gas and dust. And then the bright one there is helping to illuminate it. It's extraordinary. The other thing that the, the web was able to do in my very limited understanding was discover kind of analyze and identify the gases coming from exoplanets am i correct I, i'm like yes and so you know this is a pointed to a very different capability of web so this is where instead of taking an image in a certain color and combining them to make those dramatic images you spread the light out and try and reveal much more information about what you're looking at and this was a one of the planets that was done for the first release to show that this could be done but it also a recent another analysis revealed that for the first time that that it was a planet with carbon dioxide on it this is not a planet which could ever harbor life it's too hot it's too close to a star it's changing a lot but this is a pointer to what Webb is going to be able to do over the years is look at planets that are moving in front and behind a star and get the data that's needed to tell us something about the composition of their atmospheres. So this is a whole sort of next generation step in capability that Webb has that over the years will re reveal a lot about a lot of different planets. Whether it reveals that there's any life on them, that's a, that's a tough step beyond this. I think it'd be very hard for Webb to do that but it's a major step forward in studying the exoplanets, uh, planets elsewhere. Um, this is extraordinary. So I want to, I do want to get to some, some audience questions while we can. Sure. Um, let's see, here we go. Have you been surprised? Is there anything that was a, a shock as, as these images have come back and that you've been able to analyze them yourself? Yeah, so I think the thing that really surprised us as we looked at the very early images of those distant galaxies, we found some galaxies that were very massive, very bright, just hundreds of millions of years after the Big Bang. We had not expected this. And so one of Webb's science goals was trying to understand the formation of the first galaxies. So looking back 13 and a half billion years, almost back to the beginning of the universe itself. And so that was a complete surprise. And we did that four or five days after there were a number of groups that did this after the first data came in. So a huge flurry of activity, 
in a sense, the competition playing out with people trying to write a paper and put it on the preprint servers to get visibility, but also picking up on something that was absolutely new and unexpected with web. Um, James asks the web has already discovered already discovered many ancient galaxies that challenge the assumptions of the Big Bang theory. Additionally, it's discovered it revealed many recent galleries. Are we what can we expect from this? Are we beginning a complete reevaluation of the Big Bang? No, I don't think so. I think that we have an amazing amount of information from particularly from a European microwave satellite called Planck which really tells us about the cosmology, when the universe formed and how it grew in the very broadest way. What Webb is doing is starting to reveal the way that we don't, we had the wrong ideas maybe about how galaxies might have grown at early times. So it's much more about how galaxies formed and grew that Webb will really reveal. But the cosmology, the framework, the Big Bang, I think that that is pretty safe, as it were, in the sense that we have a lot of information about that. Um, we've gone so over time. I want to just keep you for two more questions, if you don't mind, Garth. Certainly. Um, the first is, I'm curious about the community of citizen scientists. And I think of this um, kind of in my experience with disaster movies, that it's always the young grad student that finds the asteroid that's coming to Earth that's going <laughs> to kill us all. Um, but are there, are, I mean, is that one of the reasons that this is released to everyone in the hopes that some brilliant 15-year-old somewhere is going to figure out something that people like you or the, you know, the, the greatest experts and astrophysicists and astronomers from around the world can't somehow see? You know, I think it is it is great that the data is made available because people look at things with different eyes and with different, you know, you know, an astronomer may come out with 20 years of experience and go, you know, I want to look for this or that. But, you know, somebody younger may just come in with thinking, what, what's going on here and take a fresh approach and find something quite different. So I'm really excited by the opportunities that arise from having things made available to everybody. And so, yes, I really like the opportunities then encourage people, if you're interested, get in there, get some images, look at them and try and, you know, work out if there's something novel in there that you maybe are seeing that other people are not. Um, I, you must be a great professor. I can just see it. My <laughs> last question for you is, you know, in 1987, your now Nobel Prize winning um, director, um, gave you the assignment to, you know, start, well, I have the exact phrase, go think about the next mission. And that became kind of the, <clears throat> the next space telescope. Hubble hadn't even been launched yet, and you were off on your next mission. Um, now that Webb is a far and away success, um, what, Professor Garth Illingworth, is your next mission? <laughs> well, these take a long time. I don't think I have another 33 years <laughs> left. <laughs> but nonetheless, I think, you know, we're already as astronomers talking about another big telescope, which particularly is aimed towards trying to understand whether there's life on planets around stars in our galaxy. So this has already been talked about for more than a decade or so and is has been recommended recently by a very prestigious committee so i think the next big thing is a telescope that will not only sort of take a step beyond web but be particularly looking for the interest that you and others have of course in whether we are alone and so it's helping us and i hope we'll answer that question but it's going to take a few years <laughs> They um, always do. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been an absolutely extraordinary conversation. For for those that have been watching, um, there is so much more to learn about this. We have scratched the surface. There's so much history to the Webb Telescope, and it's the time it took, the budget, Congress got involved. I mean, it's whole drama. Um, so I really encourage you to check out all of the resources to visit Garth's website, um, follow NASA's work, follow the Webb's got an Instagram account, Twitter. It's really, really great. Um, before you all go, I would like to invite you next week. We welcome historian Bill 
Carol Deverall from the um, Institute on California in the West from um, the Huntington in USC. He joins us to discuss the latest Alta serial. The final installment will be revealed on Monday. We're going to talk about Finding Francis. I hope you'll join us for that. That's September 14th at 1.30 late start time. Um, but most importantly, Professor Garth Illingworth, thank you so, so very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you very much, Beth. It's been absolutely delightful to chat with you and all your listeners and watchers of our web. It is incredible. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Take care, everyone.